Ladies and gentlemen and fellow tech enthusiasts, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome on the show Tech Today, well, we have a very special guest. Romesh Vadwani is joining us all the way from Palo Alto. Romesh, what an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and, of course, as a distinguished speaker at the Tech Today Congress. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Romesh, I'd like to start off by asking you about the advent of AI over the past few months. When we talk about AI, it's interesting that everyone's been really uh, you know, talking about AI synonymously with what OpenAI is doing with ChatGPT or what Google's done with BART because now there's a face or a product really for generative AI. But in terms of your AI journey, what I find fascinating is in 2018, you set up Vadwani AI here in Mumbai and there was very noble objectives with what you were doing at Vadwani AI. Of course, that project has scaled up as the first AI institute here in India. But the whole concept of AI for social good. Now, in light of what's happening in the world of AI with generative artificial intelligence, how much has that plan changed with Vadwani AI and your efforts across uh, the group? Um, the plan has absolutely accelerated uh, because of generative AI. And perhaps to put it in perspective, I can give you a little historical context here about AI because most people mm -hmm didn't really pay much attention to AI till just recently because of chat GPT and, you know, other uh, similar uh, large language models and chatbots. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, my own journey with AI began more than 50 years ago. So I went to uh, IIT Bombay, got my degree in electrical engineering, came to the US, went to Carnegie Mellon University turned out that in 1970 in Carnegie Mellon University, two of the professors were there were the among the pioneers of the fledgling start of AI technology. Uh, the Herb Simon and Alan Noel were two of the many professors that I had the privilege of working with. And that's kind of where my interest in the then AI began. Subsequently, after get, graduating with my PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. I started my first company in 10 years. My second company was called American Robot, and that was in the 1980s mm -hmm. with the then primitive hardware compared to what's available today. Uh, I began to use AI in high precision robots and also used AI to create the world's first artificial uh, vision system that could be used in factories in conjunction with robots to help them see and perform better in, in the work that robots do in factories. And then in the 90s, when I was building Aspect Development, we were building one of the first companies using the concepts of big data and enterprise software applied to the supply chain. I began to use pattern recognition, similar to what you would consider to be the basis of AI models in that company. And then in the 2000s, when I was building Symphony Technology Group into a group that grew to about two and a half billion in revenue, we used mm -hmm. AI in a number of the companies that I was building inside Symphony Technology Group. Now in 2017, uh, I kind of felt that the AI journey had gone through a whole bunch of ups and downs. There were years in which VCs were willing to invest any amount in AI companies, and there were decades in which the VCs ran away as fast as possible from the word AI. So there was actually something called the AI winter in the 1990s and the 2000s where these companies were simply not interested in investing. However, in 2017, I felt that the business to consumer platforms such as you know Google and Meta and Alibaba and others were successfully using AI as part of their B2C platforms, part of their recommendation engines and so on. And yet I felt that the business enterprise was a laggard in using mm -hmm. AI technology. So I thought maybe there was an opportunity here to build a couple of great companies that would be leaders in enterprise AI and simultaneously start using AI in my foundation to apply AI for social good. So on one side, through the companies, apply it for business good. On the other side, apply it right. for social good. On the business side, 
I started two companies, uh, one called uh, Concert AI, which is focused on applying advanced AI for life sciences and healthcare. And the other one is mm -hmm. called Symphony AI, which is focused on applying AI for retail, financial services, and manufacturing. Uh, both companies are doing well. We have we went from startup in 2017 to about 4,000 employees now, and combined revenues are significantly north of $500 million, and they're both growing rapidly. However, since I'm you know very philanthropically minded, I'm giving away about 90% of my net worth uh, uh, through philanthropy, through Vadwani Foundation, but focused on some very specific large-scale objectives that I would like us to achieve. These are around job creation through large-scale right. initiatives in entrepreneurship, small business growth, um, skills development, and innovation. Mm -hmm. On the innovation side, I thought, okay, maybe there's a way in which we can combine the idea of philanthropically funded innovation with AI applied to social good. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my younger brother, mm -hmm. Sunil, who has his own foundation in India called the Wish Foundation, which is doing great work in healthcare. And together, we decided to fund and launch the Vadwani AI Institute for Social Good based in Mumbai. And we have over 100 AI researchers right now, uh, and we are doing Mm -hmm. All kinds of exciting projects in healthcare, agriculture, TB eradication, and a number of other areas. Uh, we have large teams of people who work with government of India ministries to help them uh, right. apply AI to achieve uh, national programs for national benefit. So that journey has now mm -hmm. been in process for five years. Now, what's changed right. is that generative AI first began mm -hmm. to emerge as a serious uh, technology towards the end of last year. And even though I've Excellent. been in AI for over 50 years, I didn't actually pay as much attention to it as I could have in 2016, 17, 18, when OpenAI was right. being built. At that time, OpenAI's own mission was a little confused, it was sort of meandering all over the place, not completely clear. But last year, right. when I started looking at it, and particularly January this year, when I, I did a deep dive technology review to see where generative AI technology was, the rate at which right. it was evolving, and what that could mm -hmm. mean, both for good and for harm. And mm -hmm. that got me absolutely committed to changing everything. Because having been through this journey for 50 years, I can tell you with complete conviction, and it's probably not news to you, that this is the AI revolution. There's no other point in the last 50 Absolutely. years I can think of where I felt that AI would be world changing, game changing, but I do feel that way right now. And it's partly and because of the power, yeah. It's the power of today's technology, but even more than that, speed. The speed with which it is evolving. So sorry yeah, for that. Absolutely, Mr. Vadwani. Like and it's a, yeah. No, and it's a fascinating journey that you've had. And there's, there's so many learnings from that particular journey. And I appreciate that you've been so candid with that particular response. But you mentioned the Metas and Alibabas of the world. And when we talk about how the US and big tech has been looking at AI, look, this is not news to anyone. But it's interesting that even across the border in China, there is a big focus on AI and AI development. In fact, uh, they sort of elucidated uh, on what their plans are like. Do you think that in this global AI race, India has a pivotal or a key role to play with the likes of what you're doing at the Vadwani Foundation, what the Indian government is working on, several such initiatives? and. The, there's no dearth of talent at a lot of these top tech companies. There's a lot of Indian and Indian origin, um, you know, engineers who are genuinely driving the AI revolution, so to speak. Where do you see India's role in this AI revolution? And, and where, where does India stand vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in the US and perhaps in China? 
It's an excellent question, and uh, I've thought about it quite a bit. And uh, uh, I was in India in February uh, about three months ago, mm -hmm. discussing exactly this topic uh, with a uh, number of key uh, business leaders, uh, political leaders, as well as my foundation team. And my feeling is it is not only India's great opportunity, but actually it is India's responsibility to be one of the top three players in AI. Now, can India be number one or number two? At least at this stage, I don't see it. But can India be number three in the world in AI? That mm -hmm. is absolutely possible. Now, to do that isn't going to just happen accidentally. It's going to require massive national scale initiatives for the application of AI, ministry by ministry, program by program. Uh, and just as digital transformation has played a big role in India's progress over the last few years with you know, national platforms like Aadhaar and UPI and others, uh, I think there's need for an AI transformation of many programs that the Indian government has or could have and could plan. Clearly, there's an mm -hmm. opportunity to take the enormous talent that we have built in the IT industry and evolve it mm -hmm. or repurpose it to play a much bigger role globally in the AI sector mm -hmm. because we have enormous talent, but the talent right now is being used in relatively limited ways uh, compared to the opportunities provided by AI. Expanding that mission, expanding that journey will be key. Education, uh, with the exception of a few IITs, AI is not being taught anywhere. And my feeling is over the next five years, uh, we will have to teach AI in high schools, we'll have to teach it in the colleges, we'll have to teach it in the vocational training institutes, we'll have to teach it in the industrial training institutes, we'll have to change mm -hmm. the concept of what skills means. And because I'm mm -hmm. such a strong and passionate believer in that, when I was in India, as I said in February, I had three and a half days of meetings with my foundation team, and we turned the entire agenda of our foundation upside down. We came into 2023 with a plan uh, for the foundation for 2023. By the time I left, we had a different plan in which we had made generative AI a central technology for accelerating our mission of entrepreneurship education, skills education, uh, job creation, innovation, the work of the Badwani AI Institute, all of these things. Uh, were uh, are, are being, I would say, accelerated, improved with the idea mm -hmm. of delivering much, much higher impact. I'll give you an example. Uh, this year, mm -hmm. Vadwani Foundation, uh, in one of its programs, which is called the Vadwani Skills Network, we are skilling 150,000 students in vocational training institutes, uh, about 1,000 or so vocational training institutes in India, Right. Uh, around core employability skills and some adjacent vocational skills as well. The program has been very successful. It's been extremely well received by the entire sort of community from government agencies, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Education, the vocational training institutes and the employers. So my challenge to my team right. was 150,000 was good with the old technology. Why can't we make it 10 million with right. the new technology, generative AI? So that got our leadership team and the foundation thinking. And we are on a journey where next year, we're going to go from 150,000 to 500,000 using Gen AI. Following year, 1 to 1 1.5 million. And year by year after that, the idea will be to keep scaling up. It would not have been possible mm -hmm. without the application of generative AI. Similarly, the application of generative AI to our other foundation programs and by the Vadwani AI Institute, to all the programs that they're doing in agriculture and healthcare, it's all a massive transformation that's happening at the foundation level too. Absolutely, you, you mentioned the AI race and perhaps a podium finish for India as well with competition from China and of course what's happening in the US. But one key component to that particular race would be the country or region which actively 
understands how to regulate AI and if AI needs to be regulated at all. What are your thoughts, Mr. Vadwani, on a regulatory framework being imperative for AI now that the genie is out of the bottle? We had Professor Stuart Russell join us on the show a few weeks ago and he said that if guardrails are not put in place, it could be a Chernobyl-like situation for AI. Are you of the same view? Yes, I'm of the same view. I, I would just say that the use of the word guardrails is a is very innocent language and probably needs a lot more than guardrails. And I, I'll give you an analogy mm -hmm. here. Uh, people have talked about using comparables like the regulation of atomic energy by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Well, the International mm -hmm. Atomic Agen uh, Energy Agency is, first of all, not that effective because we can see that there's been a proliferation of atomic energy in North Korea and emerging in Iran and in Pakistan and other countries. All of them mm -hmm. circumvented the rules of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. And the second thing is mm -hmm. atomic energy, uh, energy is much easier to regulate because it takes billions and billions and billions of dollars to create an infrastructure for atomic energy. It takes $5 billion, $10 billion to build a nuclear plant. It takes tens of billions of dollars to build a you know, uranium Absolutely. processing plant that can create weapons-grade uranium or a plutonium plant. Absolutely. Those, Absolutely. those restrictions do not apply to AI. You can, uh, the, the problem is even well-meaning companies like Meta have put large language models into open source. So once it's in open source, a bad actor gets it for free, a good actor gets it for free. The bad actor who gets it for free can poison the large language model with only a small amount of training data that is bad data. It's dangerous data, but you can corrupt these large language models with relatively small amounts of data, which is I'm using the word poison data, and uh, it can be done for hundreds of dollars with yeah. one smart hacker sitting in a you know bedroom somewhere anywhere in the world. So the barrier to creating AI that can create a lot of damage mm -hmm. is extremely low. The barrier to creating nuclear weapons and atomic energy plants is extremely high. And that is an imbalance that I don't think people have completely put their heads around yet, but they need to, because for every one country that created a 30-year program to produce, you know, fissionable uranium, one billion people potentially could create bad AI that can do harm for just a few thousand dollars or a few hundred thousand dollars each. So what are the implications of that? I was trying to look for a regulatory parallel. And really the only one that comes even close is the US FDA, the, the Food and Drug Administration uh, regulates okay. uh, all kinds of drugs, right? To get a drug approved, you have to go through a phase one process, which is a safety analysis. Is it safe? You have to go through a phase two process, which is, is it safe and effective? You have to go through a phase three process, which is, is it safe, effective, and can be scaled up and still remain effective. And then there's a phase four process of monitoring the actual performance of the drug after it's been approved, after it's been released. I think AI has some parallels to that. It needs to be regulated for safety. It's more than just guardrails. It needs to be regulated for effectiveness. It needs to be regulated for the field of purpose, because if you're using it for mm -hmm. limited scientific purposes, you can give a wider license to innovate. If it's going to be released to 100 million people or 1 billion people, you have to apply far greater, you know, uh, validation and testing of all that. So long way of saying, mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that regulation is needed. I believe that a regulatory agency is needed because no existing regulatory agency has the subject matter expertise and or the processes that will be needed to regulate AI effectively. And 
you know, this is something that has to happen very, very quickly because as you just said, uh, you know, when Absolutely. large companies like Meta release large language models to open source, it means the genie is out of the bottle. When the genie is out of the bottle, we know it's impossible to put it back in. So how do you get international cooperation? You know, how do you create common regulatory framework so that people can't just play games by registering their activities in this country versus that mm -hmm. country? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a mess. Uh, and the world is going to have to move extremely fast. Uh, China is already doing stuff in regulation. Uh, so they have declared as their number one regulatory principle that no AI model can do anything that goes against the social and political philosophy of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, well, that's right. China, right? That's not India, and that's not the yeah. US, that's not most other democratic countries. And then they have a whole bunch of things that they're trying to regulate. For example, they want algorithms to be regulated and approved. They, they want to make mm -hmm. sure that the data that's used to train algorithms uh, meet certain tests and that no private data is being used unless prior approval has been obtained, etc. Uh, I think this is an area, again, in which the US and India could collaborate uh, yeah. because there's no reason yeah. for there to be a different regulatory framework in India versus the US. We can create common standards that India can apply its own way Absolutely. and the US can apply its own way. Similarly, on the technology side, I feel that there's enormous opportunity here for the US and India to collaborate. Yeah. And I don't think that collaboration right. has begun, but it should, because if yeah. India wants to be number three, the US is probably going to remain number one in AI, so long as, you know, the US mm -hmm. uh, include me, we don't mess it up. But right now, the US is significantly ahead of China in certain aspects of AI, yeah. but behind in other aspects of AI. So if we keep the momentum up, the US can retain its uh, number one position. China is probably number two. But India right now is mm -hmm. nowhere near number three and needs to move incredibly fast uh, to get to number three. Fair enough. You know, you've elaborated on some of these concerns. Another concern that from my usage of chat GPT and other uh, generative AI bots is that these lang language learning models, these LLMs rely heavily on data. And some of their data sets are of course outdated, but with machine learning, we know the sort of data we are feeding into these systems. It's just a case of deja vu for a lot of consumers. We've entrusted so many big tech companies with our data over the years. With this AI revolution shaping up, Mr. Vadvani, how, how crucial is it for us to have some sort of, like I said, uh, safeguards in place, particularly for our privacy and security when it comes to our data? I think it's incredibly important because one of the reasons that uh, social networks in the US have succeeded is because all the data that they use to succeed is free. So in a sense, it's been a devil's bargain, right? On the one hand, the consumer gets to use Facebook or any other social platform for free. Uh, and Facebook makes their money through advertising. But to make their money through mm -hmm. advertising, they need to sell the private data of the 1 billion or 2 billion uh, consumers who are using the Facebook platform. The same applies to any other social networking platform. So in a sense, consumers have sold their souls in exchange for getting free access to platforms like Facebook. Well, that was fine when social networking was, you know, sort of the, the baseline. But in a world of AI where your data, your personal data can not only be used to benefit you individually, it can also be used to benefit others that you may not want to help, and it can be used to harm Absolutely. others that you do not want to harm. How do you protect that from happening? And I think uh, data privacy laws, similar to what the European Union passed a few years ago, you mm -hmm. know, GDPR, I think something like that Absolutely. is needed in the US and in India. Uh, no such privacy uh, regulations are there in the US today. I'm not 
fully up to speed on what the privacy regulations are in India, but it's definitely needed. But I think the 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 the, the challenge is going to get much greater, much much faster. Now today, you 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 mentioned ChatGPT. It's based on scraping all the data on the web, right? So the data on the web includes uh, all the material we've put up on the web. It could be consumer information, it could be business information, it could be other kinds of information on the web. Who owns the copyrights to that? You know, how's that going to get settled? Absolutely. There's the potential to be a big swamp. Uh, and then as large language models start becoming more personalized and start focusing in, on niche applications, the need for highly precise data from individual sets of consumers uh, will become more important. So what kind of regulations do we need uh, to protect the consumer and at the same time make sure that that data is not being used for harm? Mr. Badwani, AI has been seen as this disruptive force. And like you said, this is the moment for AI, uh, given your long journey with this particular technology. But now that you, if you do a little bit of crystal ball gazing and you look at the next three to five years, let's say in the short term or medium term, what are the key sectors where we'll see disruption? And when I say disruption, I mean it as a double-edged sword. Uh, will it be taking away jobs out there? Will it be augmenting a lot of existing workforces. What are those sectors that you have identified um, you know, with your research and, and your expertise? So I, I, I'll start by answering the question in reverse by indicating a sector in which generative AI is not likely to have a significant jobs okay. impact. And that's really uh, jobs in the agriculture sector, jobs in the construction sector and blue collar mm -hmm. jobs in the manufacturing sector. Uh, I would say that jobs that require information processing, knowledge processing, uh, most white collar jobs, whether they are in the legal sector, the financial sector, the IT sector, the um, the analysts, the creative community, all these are subject mm -hmm. to massive disruption. Now, before I come back and talk about disruption, let me just give you examples of industry sectors where this technology is going to have an impact starting now and accelerating literally every week, every month for the next three to five years. So I'll start with life sciences mm -hmm. and healthcare Drug discovery is going to get revolutionized, going to happen much, much faster. Clinical trials, which currently take three years or longer, probably be accelerated down to about 50% of that time. Uh, the personalization of medicine, where drugs can be, uh, uh, you know, sort of targeted for specific individuals, uh, that, that will happen, you know, relatively soon. Uh, so that's the life sciences side. If I take the healthcare side, and I'll use India as a very good example, I think you may have mm -hmm. followed the recent research that was done by Microsoft on how GPT-4 can be used to diagnose medical conditions. And there's some fascinating mm -hmm. examples. Uh, they took a very, very difficult example of someone who used to live in Africa, came to the US, has been in the US for six months, has a rather rare medical condition with they take the blood test with all the attributes of the blood test all the readings and give it to gpt 4.0 and compare the results of gpt 4.0 with a panel of five doctors and gpt 4.0 was actually better and not only did gpt 4.0 come up with the right answer they asked gpt4 to explain how it got the answer it provided an explanation it asked gpt4 to say what alternative scenarios could there have been that would have caused the answer to be different? GPT-4 came back and described that. So that's called, you know, reasoning. And so GPT-4 didn't just analyze data, it actually performed some pretty high level complicated reasoning. So in India, when you think about the healthcare system and you get outside the mm -hmm. big cities and the Apollo hospitals and the Fortis hospitals, you get down to the district level, the community level, the village level, 
there's massive opportunity mm-hmm. to improve healthcare. So think of the idea of generative AI based co-pilots that are helping and right. augmenting the capabilities of primary care physicians in the at the district level. They're helping the Anganwadi workers. There's two million or two and a half million Anganwadi workers down at the you know the community and the village level, helping the ASHA workers, their skills in primary health could be improved by hundred to one, thousand to one. And by doing that, I think in less than five years, India could have one of the best you know, healthcare systems, primary healthcare systems in the world using generative AI. Similarly, education. The I gave you an example earlier of how we are planning to use it in skills education, entrepreneurship education, but primary education can be revolutionized with tutors, uh, high school education can be revolutionized, college education, we can help make a large number of India's colleges as good as the IITs, make the IITs even better than the MITs. You know, all these things are possible. S- similar benefits in manufacturing and retail and entertainment. Now, if I take the disruptive impact of all this, uh, I, uh, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, as part of the foundation's activity, uh, you know, I set up this mm-hmm. Vadwani uh, uh, with my brother, Vadwani AI Institute for Social Good in Bombay. But I should also mention that uh, only three weeks ago, I established the Vadwani AI Center for National Security in Washington, D.C., uh, in partnership with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I've been on the board for the last 10 years. And I provided right. a $5 million initial grant to you know get the center up and operating. As part of the inaugural on May 9th, I gave them an example of how disruptive this could be for white collar jobs in the US. So studies have been done by large consulting firms that show that for the kinds of jobs in the US that pay more than $50,000 a year, somewhere between 30% and 50% of the work will be automated with generative AI and future versions of that technology. There are about 50 million such jobs in the US right now. So I'm not going to give you the math because the numbers are a little scary, but I think people can figure out for themselves. If you take this kind of productivity improvement happening this fast, Mm -hmm. this is not something that's going to happen over 30 years. This is something that's going to happen over two or three years. What will be the Absolutely. impact on unemployment in that salary sector, which is the entire middle class or a substantial part of the middle class? Mm-hmm. Now, in India, mm-hmm. uh, obviously, salaries are at very different levels. But in the software sector, there will be a lot of disruption because generative AI can be used to perform the work that is today being performed by junior software engineers or even mid-level software engineers. Three years from now, Generative AI will be doing the work of the most senior software engineers. How do they need to change their knowledge and their their, uh, career plans to take advantage as compared to getting disrupted? So massive disruption coming. Unfortunately, that's not something you Mm -hmm. can regulate, right? Because if you over-regulate to the point that you stop innovation, then several negative things can happen. First of all, China can get the lead over every democratic society, right? Because China is not subject to the same right. kinds of conversations we are talking about. And secondly, generative right. AI has the opportunity to do an enormous amount of good. You don't want to block the ability to do good simply because of fear. So. Right. The, the whole notion of preparing for disruption, even when generative mm-hmm. AI is doing good, and right. regulating against harm, where generative AI has the potential to do harm, this is the challenge of, I would say, our lifetimes, but, but 23, 2024, 20, 2025, these yeah. are the three years. We better get it right. We better get it right. Mr. Vadwani. Mr. Vadwani, what I find, Vadwani, what I find interesting about your journey and also the fact 
that you, you speak about themes like AI for social good is the fact that there is several problems that need to be solved, largely for the underserved, for the bigger population. And you alluded to your philanthropy goals earlier on in this conversation. I want to move away from just AI and, and understand the thought process behind that because a lot of entrepreneurs who are really raising funding here in India, I feel like eventually, you know, what you're doing uh, right there in Palo Alto is a very noble uh, goal and a very evolved sort of thought process. Just to get into your mind and unlock exactly what the rationale is, how crucial do you think um, apart from the serotonin release, philanthropy in 2023 and beyond, how important is it for a lot of us to be wired towards that as an eventual goal, uh, be it in terms of filling gaps in public funding or fostering innovation? What was your rationale to, to really you know, come up with that thought? So my rationale, actually, that's an excellent question, by the way. Uh, so I, I'll start by answering it and saying, I believe everyone needs to be a philanthropist because you can be a philanthropist by giving $1. You can be a philanthropist by giving $100 billion or anywhere in between. Uh, no one has a monopoly on being a philanthropist. We are all philanthropists at heart. The key is how do we exercise that philanthropy? So 20 years ago, when I was starting Vadani Foundation, obviously, these were important questions I had to ask myself. And the first question I asked myself was, OK, what is the definition of philanthropy? And this may not satisfy some of your viewers, but one of the conclusions I came to was giving money to temples and giving money to family in my book does not qualify as philanthropy. When you give money to temples, Perhaps you're doing it for good religious reasons. Perhaps you're doing it because it's a bargain with God that I will do this for you if you will do something else for me or my family. Doesn't really matter. I just felt that at least relative to formal philanthropy, I excluded those as possibilities. Doesn't mean I don't give to temples, I do. That doesn't mean that I, you know, don't give to family. I give huge amounts to family, uh, but I simply don't treat that as formal philanthropy. Now, in philanthropy, I had two fundamental questions. One is, do I want to help individuals for the moment? Or do I want to help individuals change the course of their lives such that it will also have positive effects on future generations of those individuals and those families? I chose the latter path because when there's an earthquake, people need help. You can have relief programs. Relief philanthropy is an excellent philanthropy. It's simply something that I chose not to focus on. What I chose to focus on was the area of job creation, because my feeling is mm -hmm. that particularly in economies where job creation is limited, expanding job creation, creating opportunities is the best thing you can do mm -hmm. for a human being for various reasons. It changes the course of their lives. It changes their belief in the future. It opens up future opportunities that I might never have dreamed of or they might never have dreamed of. And it changes the course of the next generation of their families. Their kids will go to better schools. They'll get a better education. They will rise to a higher level and everything will go in a virtuous cycle. So for 20 years, that has been my driving focus that I want to be a helpful partner to governments, other partners in accelerating job creation, primary focus on mm -hmm. India, but also focusing on other populous uh, countries, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, Philippines, Bangladesh, Nigeria, mm -hmm. Egypt, South Africa, several others. And in each of those, we are building teams of people all 100% funded by Vadwani Foundation. I don't take money from anyone else. I don't raise capital from anyone else. I don't ask the Indian government or any government for money of any kind. We do side-by-side -side programs with governments. We do side-by-side -side programs with other philanthropies. But all Vadwani Foundation funding is my funding. And uh, that's the journey. Then the question is, what is it mm -hmm. you can do to accelerate job creation? Mm -hmm. And that led to the idea mm -hmm. that if we could help create one million more entrepreneurs in India, 
and a few hundred thousand more entrepreneurs in Brazil and Mexico and Nigeria, mm. one day they would all hire people that would create a lot of jobs. If we can help small businesses Absolutely. that are growing at 5% a year grow at 25% a year, that will create jobs. If we, you know, skill people such that they can become self-employed rather than simply going to work for a large mm -hmm. company, that self-employment mm -hmm. or micro-entrepreneurship will create jobs. So that led to the design of all our initiatives. And because I want mm -hmm. to build for scale, all initiatives are technology enabled. We've developed a platform, a tech platform called Honar, which uh, is being used by all our initiatives to keep accelerating scale. And Hunar is now generative AI enabled to help us scale up faster. Mr. Badwani, those are very noble thoughts and I hope a lot more budding entrepreneurs share the same sort of goals eventually. As a last question before we wrap up for the day, we spoke so much about big tech and the advertising models and how data sets operate in the world of chat GPT. But all of this was from a web to world. Now you've seen the internet evolve over the years and now there's so much talk of a decentralized web or web three. I'd love to get your thoughts on it and do you think this could also genuinely be a disruptive force? Is this the next big thing? Could this be the future? Uh, it could be uh, uh, and, and the reason I say it could be is because I don't think web 3.0 or web 4.0 whatever they're going to finally call it is going to be divorced from AI. AI is going to be an embedding technology in any future version of the web. Therefore, it will be subject to the same, so that future web will be subject to the same issues that we just talked about in the last half an hour. And what are the implications of that in terms of regulation of the next generation of the web? I don't think people have completely gotten that far in their thinking because web thinking began on one track. Like we had web 1.0, we had web 2.0, now we can go to all these you know, decentralized webs and each of these webs can have different kinds of capabilities and all that. That's cool. But a lot of the empowerment of those webs comes from AI and now mm -hmm. generative AI. And by the way, generative AI is already showing impressive or alarming, depending on your point of view, uh, capabilities and reasoning and metacognition and physical awareness all kinds of stuff that you only expected from human beings. Uh, but now, Absolutely. if you now translate that to artificial general intelligence, which is where an AI can perform most tasks as well or better than a human being can, I used to think that was like 2050. Then I thought it was 2040. Then I thought it was 2035. <laughs> I'm thinking now it's like 2026 or 2027. Absolutely. So if that coincides Maybe sooner. with your Maybe sooner. of the web, what happens? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what happens. Absolutely, Mr. Vani. Thank you so much for such an insightful and candid chat. It really helped us all on Tech Today and, and here at Business Today to connect all the dots and really get a bird's eye view of what's happening in the world of technology, what's happening in the world of AI. We really appreciate you taking time out and joining us today. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.